Hello, welcome back. Um, this is going to be tutorial number two. We're going to talk about the timeline, i.e. the sequencer window, um, transport controls and things like that, your snapping tool, and then uh, we'll get into some actual programming of uh, hmm, probably some drums be a good place to start. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive in. Um, this is your sequencer window, and um, by the way, both of these tabs are uh, removable. So you can click the little thing here to hide that panel, to show it. Um, and this one hides the sequencer, I think on a smaller screen, like my students who are working on uh, Chromebooks that are 14 inch wide screens. Uh, you need all of the resources you can, all of the real estate you can, and that stuff has just got to be uh, just moved out of the way whenever possible. Um, so here, um, this is your transport kind of like window here. Uh, it sort of shows you what's on screen. And you can manually drag this in and out, obviously, all the way. Way over here on the right side, this is your end of song marker. Um, it basically means that that's where it's going to stop playing. If I put it at the 32 measure mark here, um, then that's the maximum it'll show on screen. Um, where that comes into effect is, for example, when you publish a song, um, it finalizes it and it uh, mixes it into a um, like a wave file, um, sort of similar to like um, SoundCloud does. Um, there used to be a, a hookup between Audio Tool and SoundCloud, but I think it disappeared. Um, I'm not sure what the, what's going on with that. Probably a rights issue. Who knows? Lawyers, curses. Um, so. Um, when you mix your file down into a wave file when you publish it uh, and and your end of song marker is way over here um, it'll basically generate silence so if your th song is 32 measures long and your end of song is at bar you know 128 by default um, then obviously you're gonna have a heck of a lot of silence at the end of it um, and it'll it'll say like the sound of silence the little window will pop up and says you know, do you want to remove this which is fine you just say yes and it'll you know like truncate all that silence off um, and then the other way is just to move the end of song marker if you're picky and you know OCD a little bit like me ah, either way um, now this uh, this thing can also be zoomed in and out with the mouse wheel which is by far the most convenient way if you want to zoom it into like wherever in your song you are and obviously the playback indicator is the little line right here that moves across I just hit the space bar to play it back um, hit the space bar again now you notice the little tiny little green pip over here that can be moved by clicking on your timeline anywhere and that's where your um, your your song will start from the next time you push the space bar. Now, if you put it over here and then you hit stop, then it automatically relocates that little green starting position uh, back to the beginning. This is an interesting thing I've noticed amongst, let's say, younger users. They don't know what a stop button is. And I was like, why, why do you not know what stop button is? That made no sense. And then I realized that uh, an iPod has no stop button. Uh, only play and pause, which is whatever. Anyways, uh, so yeah, they haven't used it before. <laughs> so yeah, makes sense. All right, uh, let's talk snapping. This is the snapping tool over here. Uh, it's a super duper important tool for like anything that we do. Um, and it basically kind of rounds things off to the nearest, in this case, bar, half note, quarter note, eighth note, tr eighth note triplet, sixteenth note, and so on, all the way down to ridiculous amounts of 128th notes. I'm not sure how musically useful that would be, but it's cool that they have it. And you can turn that on and off like this. Um, it comes in handy all the time, and you're going to use it, so get used to it. And then the last thing is the loop indicator. Um, the loop playback indicator is this control right here. As soon as it's on, this little blue window highlights. Um, that can be moved and it can be stretched. You can also activate it in a couple other ways. Um, that is also a really, really useful tool. Okay. Let's grab some drums. And I think I'm going to use a Beatbox 8 because I can. Now, personally, for me, I would probably hook up every instrument to its own channel, at least the ones that I was using. 
Uh, but here's our beatbox eight. I like to turn the volume all the way. I don't know why the volume is down. Audio tool, are you listening? Because the bass line, i.e. the TB303, that does it too. Uh, it's like halfway. It should always be like up. Um, anyway, so what do we do with this? Uh, well, right now, if we hit play, nothing happens. Um, so classic drum machine programming, you get the 16 buttons across the bottom. You can see right now they're sort of scanning across as I hit play. Hopefully you can see. Yeah, there it is. It's easier to see now. So if I click an instrument, in this case, bass drum is default, and then any of the buttons here that I push will play when the scan gets to them. Boom. Okay, and then here's my tempo. I double click. I'm going to double change the tempo down to 80. Okay, so it's a it's a pretty good emulation. Now, of course, we have individual outputs for each of these things. So, if you wanted to uh, do the pro thing and run your bass drum through a compressor or an equalizer. You could certainly do that. Um, in fact, let's do that. Let's run it through an EQ at the very least. A um, couple of choices here. You have this parametric EQ pedal, which is a single band. You have the graphical EQ, which is actually a really nice EQ. It's pretty powerful. Like if this was a real life thing, um, you've got 18 decibels of gain variable um, uh, bandwidth of course and uh, all of this is adjustable here just kind of want to fatten up the super low end just a little so we can roll off the top as well Uh, okay, so there's our kick drum. Now you also have channel EQ that you can apply. Um, that's also actually pretty good too. I think it goes up to 24 dB. Now as a tip and a trick here, when you click a knob and then you hit backspace, it resets it to its original position. That's a uh, super duper useful little tool too. All right, well let's change things here. Now here's the thing. We have uh, four banks seven patterns each um, obviously your your pattern can also be changed you can change the length of it you can also change the scale now I will say that audio tool has an error here I don't know if they noticed it but this shows that in position four here that eight of your switches are for a quarter note that is not true it's really position three four switches are for your quarter note so your quarter notes are going to be on 1, 5, 9, 13. Anybody who's used the original uh, you know, knows when you change the scale, it basically speeds up playback. So if I changed it to 3, it, it tracks through twice as fast, basically. So it, long story short, 3 and 4 are flip-flopped here. Okay, that's, that's just a goofy error. I don't even know if they've ever even noticed it. Um, it's just a graphical thing. It's just not a function issue or anything. It, it still works fine. It's just, it's almost like if somebody had reversed the sticker or something, <laughs> you'd be like, wait, what? This is not correct. I need my money back. Except it's a TR-808 and I'll never find one again. Okay. Uh, we need a snare drum. But see, I want to put this in, uh, like, let's say pattern number two, yeah? So we can right-click. We're going to copy the pattern into pattern one into our clipboard and then we're going to paste it into pattern two so now pattern one and two are identical why well because now i can change pattern two um let's go claves on that guy really loud okay and then if I want 
wanted to build it up even more, I would copy that pattern and paste it into pattern three. And then in pattern three, let's say we do a backbeat of some sort, either a snare drum, maybe a hand clap. Um, Um, so we have now, uh, we've got three rhythm patterns. All right. Now what? Well, we're going to go to add track beatbox eight. And for me, I'm going to use a pattern track. Now you can use a note track. In fact, I'll throw one on there just to show you. Um, and then I'm also going to throw on beatbox eight pattern track. Now the note tracks, if I double click, I create a region here and this is a classic, you know, DAW program note track here, piano roll editing and so on. Uh, your low starts on the C. Okay, so obviously you've got access to all of your notes here, depending on what your snapping grid is, is the size of the note that you can make. So when you change it to like 1 16th, you can see your grid size changes and you can double click to create notes and so on and you know make rhythms this way, the classic way. That was the greatest. Now, this is a weird thing about Audio Tool. You notice over here, these two little sliders, these are called the loop range sliders. And basically it says that for the length of this region, it'll play whatever is between those two. Now that's kind of cool because then you can do weird stuff like that and, and sort of set up your own almost like rhythmic interference patterns or something. Smaller than um, yeah. So there's that, and this works for anything, by the way. Uh, like samples, for example, that we'll get into. Samples, for example, huh? Uh, we'll get into that shortly in in a couple of videos. Um samples do the same thing so you have the loop range slider that you can actually use to truncate a sample or have it play back a small portion of it so you can only like let's say you wanted to use only a little bit of it you can do that you can have it repeat during that and just lengthen the region you can shorten your region just keep it one measure that sort of thing there's a lot a lot of options here um, so I'm gonna delete the track though and then in the pattern track you notice though that as soon as I did this what popped up is this blue outline. Uh, that is an automated parameter now. Okay, everything in Audio Tool can be automated. That's one of the coolest things about it. So I mean, anything you know, the level of your bass drum, you can right-click on it and go create automation and make an automation track for it. Uh, we can do all sorts of things and. Um, uh, that's kind of necessary. So basically, this is like having um, a, a mixer with full automation, um, and all of them can be fully automated. You know, faders moving and levels move changing and EQ changing dynamically and everything else. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a pretty wild thing. Um, hmm. Weird. So what do we do with this? Well, now we do the same sort of thing. Double click. Double clicking is your salvation here. Uh, I'm going to change my snap to bar. It's just so I know that it's like rounded off to the nearest bar. So like if I click over here, it'll still work. If this is rounded to quarter note and I click here, it's going to put it at the next quarter note, which is weird. Now we can double click to create a bunch of individual regions here, or we can make one and then just simply drag it out with the resize cursor. All right. Um, and then Let's just do this real quickly here. Um, I'm not going to make a really long arrangement. Uh, we can go to pattern number two. We'll double click. We'll do that for two measures as well. And then pattern number three, we'll do for four. One, two, three, four. Be careful if you're going to use even numbers. Um, you know, for example, right now I have eight measures, but it ends at nine. And this is really confusing for people. They're like, but it says nine. 
Yes, but it, that, it's not including nine. It's up to nine, which means it's you know one through eight, um, and that's a common mistake. For example, that my students make um, when they don't have songs that are sort of like long enough. Like it has to be thirty-two measures, and then they're like thirty-one. Uh, that it's on the thirty-two. <laughs> no. Anyways, hit play. And now, as soon as it gets there, it changes the pattern. And the knob moved on its own. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to add, just for uh, just for kicks. <laughs> Get it? Kicks? Cause, oh my gosh, it's freaking out. What was that? I don't know what that was. It was freaking out. Happens when you're zoomed in, and then you try to drag something over, and then your computer's fast, and then it goes... Just like that. Um, now I've, I've routed my snare drum into its own channel. So remember I was saying you can do the loop a different way. So if I want to loop just this, I right click and uh, all these options come up. I can actually color the tracks too, uh, which for organizational purposes is cool. Um, and also for making them pretty. Uh, so let's see here, we got a snare drum, right? Let's add a little bit of reverb to it. Or delay. Hmm. So this is what I was talking about with the reverb. How it's like it reads 170 milliseconds but it's like it's like 4000 it's way higher so you can st like still hear it uh, you know it's uh, the readout is not correct but then like here at 107 there's like nothing it's like definitely a room reverb at that point and then here we get to more of a hall and here we get to like Mammoth Cavern. It's a little strange. Okay, so I go with three o'clock on the room size and then done. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to be done with this tutorial here. Again, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you do well in your audio tool adventures.